Hello, my name is Eric Seaton, and I am one of the pastors at the Village Church. The following podcast is a ministry of the Village Church. We hope that it inspires you, that it draws you closer to Jesus, and it opens your eyes to the possibilities of living in the kingdom. Enjoy, and God bless. Microphone. Check, check. Put down. Yeah, number one microphone. All right, good. <laughs> All right, so last week, Mark restarted the Books of the Bible series. So we are in the Books of the Bible series, part four, year four. Is that right, Mark? Year five, year five, okay. Year five, and we have one more year to go, right? Yes, okay, at least. Yeah? We're going to try and wrap it up. Anyway, so <laughs> so we uh, we ended last year with the book of Luke, And so uh, I got a little bit of a head start on what I'm going to be talking about tonight, which is the book of Acts. Um, And the book of Acts comes right after the Gospel of John, which finishes up the four Gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, which we covered last summer. And then John, which we started again this summer and Mark talked about last week, which if you didn't get a chance to listen to, you should definitely have a listen on the podcast or re-watch on the YouTube video. And let's dive in. So, another name for the, the book of Acts, a lengthier term that came later, was called the Acts of the Apostles. And you heard Mark teaching with the kids right in the hair about what an apostle is. I have a very particularized definition that I like to give. So, an apostle is one of Jesus' earliest followers In fact, that's not even quite enough. It's one of Jesus' earliest, and therefore, because one of the earliest followers, the followers with most authority, okay? So an apostle has the authority to teach what Jesus taught because they were there for the whole thing. They were eyewitnesses to the events that happened. They know more than anybody else, and so they, being witnesses, can testify and teach, correct, and make decisions with authority. And this is their story. It's not just their story. There's a lot of other minor characters, some some new upstart people who come on the scene, and they're really fun, and it's a really interesting book. And that's probably my strongest message to you today, is that you should read it. I see I put an exclamation point, so you know I'm serious. I I use exclamation points sparingly if you, you know. I'm not the kind of person who overuses exclamation points. So when Michael gives you an exclamation point, it means I'm very excited, okay? (laughs) Or I'm yelling at you for some reason, okay? (coughs) So read it, read it, really. It's a great story. It's one of the greatest stories ever told in the history of the world. You really should read it. Let's say you're into courtroom dramas, okay? You like law and order, that kind of thing. Your favorite movie is A Few Good Men, right? There's a lot of courtroom drama in the book of Acts. And so for that reason, if you're that kind of genre of entertainment enthusiast, you should read it. There's also a lot of political intrigue. So if you like House of Cards or Game of Thrones or any number of different political intrigue shows, West Wing if you're a little bit old school, okay? There's tons of that in the book of Acts. You should read it. And also, if you love action, Acts, I mean, it's like right in the word, right? In the title of the book, right? It's got tons of action. If you love action movies, action shows, action uh, plot lines, there's tons. I'll just give you a, a taste of it. There are jailbreaks multiple jailbreaks, okay? Not one. There's at least three that I can think of off the top of my head. There are murders. There are close escapes. Um, At one time, Paul is killed by having stones thrown at him, and they think that he's dead, but he's not. And They drag him out into the outside, and they just leave him, and then he gets up later and walks it off. Um, There's a shipwreck at the end of the book, which is surprisingly detailed in all the, the, they talk about how the tackle is thrown overboard, at least in the version, the translation that I read. 
So, you know, if you like stuff like Master and Commander, the fall, far side of the world, right? I mean, there's no pirates. They, don't, they didn't have gunpowder. But there's a lot of super crazy detail about the ship and all the things that they did sailing the ship through the storm and the shipwreck and how they were trying to avoid getting shipwrecked and then did get shipwrecked on the island of Malta anyway. So there's cool stuff there. And so, yeah, there's lots of disasters that occur. There's a famine. There's earthquake. Um, there, is, there are fireballs, right? Can I say that, that there are fireballs, right? I think that counts, right? There's gushes, huge gushes of winds, right? Um, there's all kinds of, there's a shipwreck. There's a giant storm, right? Um, it's also a travel log. So if you're into like Anthony Bourdain traveling around the world kind of stuff, right? Uh, that is going on. In fact, that's one of the things that, I, so yesterday I read the book of Acts from start to finish in one sitting. I took a lot of breaks. And uh, one of the things that it took me so long to do it, it took me nine hours. So I started around 10, 9, 10 or whatever, and I, I read until like five. I, I don't know. It took me about nine hours to do the whole thing. Um, and uh, what took so long is that I kept getting fascinated by all the pictures I could find on Google Maps of all the different places that they went. Um, so it's really fun to like, especially if you use like an ancient place name on Google Maps, it will typically send you to the ruined version, not like the modern version of the city. And so they're actually, you were saying Ephesus was kind of boring. It's not boring anymore. They like unearthed this huge theater. Oh, was it Thyatira? Oh, okay. All right. Well, anyway, the, the theater in Ephesus is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff that you can uh, go take a look at with the travel log. You know, islands and beaches and uh, ruins and um, aqueducts. And yeah, it's cool. You should check it out. You should read the book of Acts. And if you like friendships, and uh, it's not really like the typical romance that you might think of as a romance, but like if you're into kind of a bromance kind of flavor of, right, like a buddy comedies, so maybe something like that, right? There's a lot of that, actually. Um, there's moments where they're, they're, they're so tearful about having to part ways, right? Like they just, they break down and, and crying. Uh, or when they're reunited after they think that they uh, were never going to see each other again, there's just overjoyed reuni- you know, reunions of people. I mean, it's really, it's really got a lot of good stuff. If you like stories in any of these genres, you should read the book of Acts. You don't have to do it in one sitting like I did. Okay, I have a suggestion about how to space it out later. All right, so about the author. So I was saying that I prepared nicely last summer to do this because I spoke on the book of Luke, which, as you might uh, have guessed, it was written by a guy named Luke. And he's the author also of the book of Acts. He was a companion of Paul. So Paul met on this missionary journey where I was talking about this kind of travelogue aspect of the story in the book of Acts. Um, He traveled around with Paul, the apostle, um, the missionary, and you can see some info about him in a couple letters that we won't get to this year, but next summer we'll be talking about 2 Timothy and Philemon, and you can go read some detail about Luke. The thing I wanted to pick out most that's interesting about uh, where Luke is in the book of Acts him as an author, is the sneaky way he inserts himself in. So last week we heard about John and the way that John refers to himself as the, gib- the, disi- the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's kind of hard to say, actually. The disciple whom Jesus loved. And it's his humble way of inserting himself into the story. And every time you read that, you know it's actually talking about the author. It's talking about John. Um, here, Luke doesn't refer to himself even in that direct of a way. It's even more subtle. So through most of the story, you'll hear about the characters referred to with pronouns of he or they, right? So Paul, he was doing this. They, Paul and Timothy, were going here. And then you'll see subtly it shifts the pronoun uses from third person into first person plural, in especially in chapter 16, and it's really abrupt, and it's not explained. But that's where Luke was part of the journey. He was part of the group. So he'll start talking about, we did this. This happened to us, right? And he's there. He was part of the traveling companions of Paul. And, you know, he drops off, and it goes back to they and he, 
and then it picks back up again later in the story. So that's something that is interesting as you're reading, if you can follow the changes in the pronoun uses, and you can see where Luke is there. He was a doctor, and we know that because it's referenced in the book of Colossians, which is another letter that's written to one of the churches, one of the places that they go uh, in the book of Acts. Um, and like I said, he wrote both the Gospel of Luke, which is the stories of the victories of Jesus, Jesus' ministry, his life, his death and resurrection, and what we're focusing on today, the Acts. And you can see this especially when you compare the intros to both Luke and then Acts. And we had Mark read the intro, and I'm going to reread them because there's a lot that I want to focus our attention on in the intros to Luke and Acts today. But also, we know some things about Luke from outside sources. So there are several second century, that is years 100s AD, that tell us about Luke. One in particular is this thing called the Anti-Marcion Prologue of Luke. So it's this, this introduction that was added by later people to when they compiled the different books of the Bible together, and they gave us more detail about what they knew, what they claimed about Luke. And this is what it says. Luke is a Syrian of Antioch, a doctor by profession, who was a disciple of apostles and later followed Paul until his martyrdom. He served the Lord without distraction, unmarried, childless, and fell asleep at the age of 84, full of the Holy Spirit. He, impelled by the Spirit, wrote this whole gospel, and afterwards the same Luke wrote the Acts of the Apostles. So we have got a lot of detail, more than we get in Acts or Luke itself, about who Luke was from this source, and it matches the other things that we're able to glean from the letters of Paul. Um, I also wanted to get, draw your attention to uh, kind of how the Bible is a bunch of books. It's more like a library than it is a book, one book by itself. Um, and also just the relative thickness of these books, like how long they are, how weighty they are compared to each other. Um, the biggest book in the Bible is the book of Psalms, which is a book of poetry and song. And uh, you can see Acts there, circled in red, is pretty comparable to the Gospels. And so sometimes, and sometimes we call it a fifth gospel because it's so central to Jesus and his victories um, after his ascension into heaven that it really could count as a fifth gospel. And you can see it in comparison there. To give you a little more detail, I kind of blew it up so you can get a sense of how big or thick it is, especially if you put Luke and Acts together, as many scholars do, as two parts of the same overall work, if you want to think about it that way. And you can see on that thickness, if you can kind of eyeball it, it's actually a huge chunk that Luke wrote of the New Testament. And I crunched some numbers. I gathered this the last time I was studying for the book of Luke. Right, You get 28 chapters of Acts, which is pretty long, comparable to Matthew, which is also 28 chapters. Um, and Luke and Acts have roughly the same amount of words, even though there are fewer chapters in Luke. And compared to Mark, the work is pretty long. So you've got this weighty book, and there's a lot there. Uh, I'm not going to try even to try and recount everything that's in the book of Acts today. Um, here's another thing about how much Luke wrote. Um, if we pick out the five authors who contributed the most to the Bible overall, uh, Moses wins out. By tradition, he wrote most of the Old Testament. But Ezra, Jeremiah, Paul, and Luke kind of are all tied for uh, second most. They have really comparable contributions if you look at the number of words. So Luke wrote something like 38,000 words if you put it all together. And uh, it's actually more words than Paul wrote, even though Paul wrote more what we consider books. But they were all pretty short letters. Okay, so you might be cons uh, curious about why he wrote what he wrote, why he wrote so much. He actually explains in the introductions to Acts and Luke. So from Acts, in my former book, Theophilus, 
I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Um, Mark talked a little bit about the apostle Thomas and his reaction to Jesus' resurrection. I thought that was an interesting tie on the many convincing proofs that he was alive. Then looking at the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke, as opposed to Acts, he says something really, really similar. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So he's really obvious in his intro to the gospel, the story of Jesus, that uh, why he's writing what he's writing. So I'm going to pull that forward for you. And I want you to think about this concept of testimony that's tight related to this other concept of knowledge. So I'm going to warn you, we're going to do a little epistemology this evening. Yeah, <laughs> Good, I like that reaction. <laughs> the philosophers in the audience are shaking their heads at me. Okay, this is good. <coughs> An account of things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So those who know are in a position to know what happened because they saw it for themselves are those that Luke investigates, interviews, and gathers information from. An orderly account he makes from it, most excellent Theophilus, that's the guy he's writing to, and you can see that it's the same person in both Luke and in Acts, so that gives us really strong hints that it's the same guy writing both. So that, so here's the purpose, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So here we have this concept of knowledge, which comes from the testimony that he's gathered. So I want to give you a quick definition of knowledge. This is oversimplified, Matt. Don't jump down my throat, okay? All right. So knowledge is something that's true justified, and that you believe. Okay, so knowledge is true justified belief. So you don't know false things. If something is false, you don't actually know it. You may think that you do, but you don't. Okay? So if something is true, then you know it. You might know it. As long as it comes from some kind of trustworthy source or you have some kind of reason or it comes to you in a certain kind of way that you justify your belief. So you need to believe something, it needs to be true, and you need to be somehow supported by justification. And then, if you have all those three factors, and maybe some extra factor that we're not going to get into, then you know it. That's what knowledge is. And I want to resurrect, bring back, redeem the idea that testimony results in knowledge, because this guy named Descartes messed it all up for us. We have this tradition starting in the 1500s, 1600s in the, in the West, in European culture, that testimony is to be uh, doubted, that we should be extremely skeptical of testimony as a source of knowledge, and that it's really not that great. But it's, it's really important, and so I want to give you a definition of it. So... Testimony happens when one person tells another person something true in a trustworthy way. So notice we have something true. So if something is true, it might meet the definition of knowledge. If it's given to you in a trustworthy way, it may be justified for you. And so if you believe something true from a trustworthy person in a trustworthy way, you know it. Or at least I think you do. And in fact, the more I was thinking about it this last way, the more I realized Almost everything, the overwhelming majority of things that we know, the source is actually testimony. So I had two doctors here this morning, both Dr. Crawfords, and I was thinking, 
you go to medical school and they tell you a lot of stuff about the human body, about biology. I don't know how much of the experiments of medical science through the ages they actually, the two Crawford doctors performed. Like, I don't, rem I, I doubt that they were digging up dead bodies to do, like, secret um, dissections, for example, which is how we learned a lot of things about the human body. And that would be learning from direct experience. But learning from testimony would be to have those crazy people who did illegal things tell me about the human body later. And if it's true and they actually saw the way the circulatory system actually worked, right, then I'll know it. Or how about all the things that I think that I know about the galaxy or even the solar system? Now, I, I haven't spent actually that much time looking through telescopes or figuring out the calculus involved in all of the gravitational forces um, of all these heavenly bodies. Like, no, people just told me stuff. They're the ones that were looking at telescopes. In fact, usually it's like second or third or fourth hand. But if it's true and they were trustworthy, then I know it. Likewise, um, if someone could look up what, uh, what the weather is in New York City right now, I, I want to use this as an example. Uh, by the way, who was the last out in the park? What was the weather like when you came, came in, Jesse? Hot. Hot. Okay. So, Jesse, who's trustworthy? has just told us that it is, yeah, usually, for the most part, yeah. Um, it is hot outside, okay? So he has just testified, and if it's true that it's hot outside and nothing has radically changed since the last time he was out there, we now know that it's hot outside on the basis of his testimony. Did anyone look up what, what's the weather? Partly cloudy, 72 degrees. So long as Keith is trustworthy... Okay, yeah, <laughs> as long as Keith is trustworthy and the app that he used on his phone is also likewise trustworthy and it's true, we all now know the temperature and the weather conditions in New York City. Yeah, exactly, right. I barely even know what that means, but on, on the testimony of Keith, right, and uh, various people could probably tell me about astronomy and the moon. Right now, I know some stuff. Oh, okay, cool. Excellent. Huh? What? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so an allegory of Maker's Camp. Okay. So suppose we wanted to know, um, because we were writing this book called The Acts of the Village Children, okay? We wanted to make this gospel. How would you know... How would you come to know about what happened at Maker's Camp last week? You would ask the children, and they would, do, they would give you what? A weird answer, yeah, probably, especially the four-year-olds, right? But if you asked the people that were there, and you kind of compiled them all together, they would testify to you. They would give you their testimony about what happened, say, inside the box maze during the course of the week. Right Now, I need to ask them because I didn't go ever inside the Bosque maze because I didn't want to bruise my knees and, um, and get gross and, yeah, exactly, and right, be claustrophobic. But Jake was there, and I could ask Jake because he went inside the box maze, and he could tell me, right, and I could ask Anna what was going on in the back wing, right, how the, the crafts went, and I would come to know what happened during Maker's Camp by testimony. So hopefully I haven't belabored this point too much, but I, I really want to pull us up out of the abyss of skepticism that we've fallen into as a Western culture. And hopefully I've convinced you at least somewhat that testimony is a legitimate and very important source of knowledge. In fact, if we don't have testimony as a source of knowledge, we don't really know much of anything. I think we know a lot, and in fact, we know a lot about Jesus and his apostles. Through the book of Acts and Luke's work on our behalf, Luke organized his gospel, not so much chronologically, but geographically. So this would be like, instead of starting about day one of Maker's Camp and telling you what happened on Wednesday, and then on Thursday, and then on Friday, 
I talked about what happened out at people's houses, okay, before they came to Maker's Camp, and then talked about the drive-in, right, for all these different people. And maybe I mixed together stories of Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday together to kind of get some really interesting stories that happen, right? And it happens out there. And then I talk about what happens in the parking lot and maybe back in the playground, in the backyard. And then I talk about what happens in the kitchen. And then I would talk about what happens here in this room at Maker's Camp. And then I would talk about what happens in the box maze because that's the center of Maker's Camp. (laughs) Okay. All right. This is Luke's organization. And Uh, That's the gospel of Luke organization. The book of Acts goes from the center out. So it's geographical in organization, the book. And you can see this Acts 1, 1 through 3, where he has Jesus say, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, the center, and in all of Judea and Samaria, which is going out from Jerusalem nearby and to the ends of the earth. So Luke, the Gospel of Luke, went outside in. So we started at the ends of the earth, which was Galilee, because to the Judean snobs, they thought Galilee was like Hicksville. It was like out there, rural, nowhere's land, right? And so the stories about happening up in Nazareth and Galilee are where he starts a lot of the stories of Jesus. And then they move inward through, very shortly through Samaria, and then they go the long way around because they can't go to Samaria. And um, they go through Judea, and then they eventually arrive in Jerusalem, and they spend a lot of time, or Luke spends a lot of time, in lots of detail about what happens the last week of Jesus' life, especially in Jerusalem. And Acts goes from Jerusalem or less than a day's walk outside Jerusalem because they're at the mountain where Jesus ascends into heaven, and then they walk back inside the city. And we have a lot of activity in the very early part of the book of Acts happening inside the city of Jerusalem. And then there's a persecution, and they get kicked out of Jerusalem, and they go to Samaria and Judea. And then eventually a church starts in Antioch in Syria, And from Antioch, it goes to the ends of the earth, which for them was Rome. Rome is the end of the earth, as far as a Jewish person is concerned. But the capital city of this enormous and extremely important empire, one of the greatest empires of all time, um, had representatives from every other empire and city and place all over the world. And so it really does go out to the ends of the earth from Rome. You've heard this, the phrase, all roads lead to Rome. I mean, there's a reason for that. It really was the center point of a lot of things. So it goes from Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, the ends of the earth. So I'm going to outline to you the story progression, but I'm going to do it pretty quickly, and if you lose your favorite story, I'm sorry, but you should go read it. So there, it starts with a transition from the Gospel of Luke And it's a little bit weird because we've hopped over the book of Luke um, with John, right? We've had this interlude of John. But I I really like that because there's some really cool stories of Jesus resurrected after his death as, as he rises from the grave and he interacts with all of these different disciples and has all these cool events. And so for me, it feels like it still leads in really nicely to um, Acts, and we get a retelling of some of those same events with more detail from Luke this time. So you have the closing events of the gospel kind of recapped, and that's book one. Uh, sorry, chapter one, and then in chapter two you have Peter and the Jewish church of Jerusalem all the way up to Antioch, all the way up to chapter twelve. So you have the focus is on the main character of Peter and the very Jewish makeup of the church. So you have its beginning is in Jerusalem, so he spends six chapters on that. There's a long chapter, chapter 8, that talks about the expansion into Samaria and beyond. There's some really cool stories of Philip there. You know what I realized, like, there's a lot of Samets brothers action going on, right? So you have Peter, and then you have Stephen, who gets killed, unfortunately, <laughs> pretty quickly in the story. But he gives a really cool sermon. So, um, and, uh, and then Philip. Um, 
is walking along. Uh, he's, he goes first to the city in Samaria, and then he's told by an angel of God to take a road from Jerusalem to Gaza. And he meets an Ethiopian eunuch, and the eunuch is reading the book of Isaiah, and um, he doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't understand the book and what it's trying to say. And so Philip walks over to him and says, would you like me to explain? He says, yes, please. Um, and he understands the gospel, comes to believe it, comes to believe in Jesus. And as they're going along in his chariot, they come across a body of water. And he says, should I just go ahead and get baptized? And Philip says, yeah, sure, why not? And then he gets baptized. And then Philip gets taken away by the spirit and reappears in another city on the coast. It's a crazy story. You should read it. The conversion of Paul happens kind of as an interlude. It reminds me kind of, of like if you're reading something like Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and they have like they're battling the orcs and doing all this stuff and then they go, meanwhile, over, you know, Frodo and Sam are like w still walking, right, <laughs> in, in Mordor, right? <laughs> you know, and, and then they go back, right? So, so that's kind of what happens with, with Paul because it's, it's like happening at the same time in another place and then they come back to the conversion of Cornelius, which is a neat story about Peter and his interaction with a Gentile centurion who's a God-fearing man, um, but it shifts this idea that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah to the idea that Jesus is the Messiah and Savior of the entire world, including non-Jewish people, which just blows Peter's mind and the minds of all the early Christians who didn't quite get that that was what was going on, even when sometimes Jesus would strongly hint at it in his ministry. And you have the formation of the Antioch Church, which brings together Paul with the new Christians who are coming up from Jerusalem. So that's a big shift, but before we do that, I'm going to look at this map, because I really like maps. So, um, so you can see from Jerusalem, outside there's these regions called Judea, which surrounds Jerusalem, and just above that, Samaria. So when there's the persecution kicked off by the death of Stephen that forces the Christians, the early Christians, out of Jerusalem, one of the first places two of the apostles go is Samaria up here. And then Philip comes back because he has this mission from the angel to go to Jerusalem and then be on the road to Gaza, and then he's somehow catapulted in the spirit to this city on, on the seashore, Ashdod, and goes on to Joppa. And Peter goes to Joppa, and he uh, interacts with this lady who has a very unfortunate name, Dorcas. And, um, and she was a widow who made clothes for everybody, and everybody loved her, and they were very, very sad when she died. And so he arrives just in time to heal her and bring her back from the dead. And everyone's really happy, and it kicks off a, new, a renewed interest in faith, in the spirit of God, and what's going on with this early Christianity. And uh, Peter goes on to Caesarea, or Caesarea, and this is like the, the capital city, as far as Rome was concerned, of this providence. The Jews thought of Jerusalem as the center of the world. Everything was important. Everything that was important happened in Jerusalem. But for the Romans, that was the city, named after Caesar, of course, in fact, there were many of them. This was Caesar by the Sea is basically what the name of it was. There was another city that was, had also named Caesar, Caesarea, but it, it had a different kind of tagline at it because you had to, there was like at least six. I looked this up the other day, yesterday. There's like at least different, three different, three to nine different Caesareas all over the place. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, I cut out the scale but um, you can walk in a day or two almost all of these places. So, like, if you, you know, we're talking, like, maybe 20, 30, 40 miles, something like that. So, a lot of these are days walks between each other. Does that give you enough detail? Yeah. I, it's really kind of interesting um, how, how close these are. But you have to remember, like, um, you barely had shoes, right? You had these like really thin <laughs> sandal things um, and the roads sometimes weren't very good. Yeah, so, but this pushes Christianity out into the surrounding regions and um, 
It eventually changes the character of the church as the Holy Spirit pushes them into the Gentile households that, uh, that it tells them to go. And it converts this guy named Paul. Right? Jesus himself actually appears visibly, audibly, to Paul on the road to Damascus. And he becomes one of the greatest missionaries of Christianity. And it, he starts the mission to Gentiles, non-Jewish people, out of Antioch. So Antioch becomes his home church, his home base. And they send him and Barnabas out to go tell other people. And he eventually ends up in Rome at the very end of the story. So that's Acts 13 through 28. So the 13 through kind of halfway towards the end of 14, you've got the Gentile mission promoted from Antioch. And there's this controversy between the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem and the new Gentile Christians in Antioch. And so they have to have this conference, this assembly, this council to figure out how they're going to do this new thing that they're doing, following Jesus. They're not really sure how the law, the old Jewish law, fits in with these new people who are not Jewish but want to follow the Jewish Messiah. And so they spend a lot of time thinking that over, praying, fasting, and uh, reasoning together. But they eventually agree that this is a great thing and should be promoted, this mission to the Gentiles, especially Antioch, supports it, and they send Paul out, and he goes all over the Roman, Eastern Roman world. He goes all over what's today modern-day Turkey and uh, Cyprus and Crete and Greece, Macedonia, and eventually ends up in Rome. And that's the climax of Paul's journey right there at the very end, 21 through 28, his journey to Rome, which includes that exciting uh, shipwreck section that I was playing up. All right, more maps. So um, the first missionary journey that Paul goes on, he starts out in Antioch. He sails over to this big island called Cyprus in the Mediterranean Sea, and he goes to some places there. And then he ends up going through this area of Turkey um, called, at the time, Galatia, which is kind of like a state of the Roman Empire. So we, you know, we're in Arizona, there's a state called California, there's New Mexico, right? So we have all these different states. So when you read the book of Galatians, it's written to the people of that area, kind of like if we had a letter to the Arizonans or something like that. So he went to a lot of individual cities and he wrote a lot of letters to individual cities, but one of his letters he wrote to a whole area, to a whole region. On his second missionary journey, he started from Antioch, but this time instead of going by sea to Cyprus and then back by ship, he went to his hometown of Tarsus and then went by land across Galatia. And then he was thinking about going to Asia where Ephesus is the capital or one of the most important cities of Asia, but he got, it's very cryptic. It doesn't fully explain what this means, but it says that the Spirit of God prevented him from going into Asia. And so he decides to go over to Troas And from Troas, that's where he picks up Luke, actually, or meets Luke, and then takes along with Luke, goes to Philippi, which was a very important city in the region of Macedonia, because he gets this vision, this dream of a Macedonian man pleading with him to come to Macedonia. And so he goes over there. And then, since he's now in Macedonia, he goes down through Greece, and he hits up some of the most important um, cities for the way that we think of the New Testament because they're all the names of the books that Paul writes, that we think of as books. They're letters that Paul writes to Philippi, which is f- becomes the book of Philippians. The letter to Thessalonica becomes the books of Thessalonians, first and second. We have uh, Corinth. He would made an important trip to Athens. He eventually gets over to Ephesus. And he took a third missionary journey, and he started from Antioch again, went the same route over land, but then from, uh, from there went straight to Ephesus, which is what his plan, I think, on the second missionary journey was. And then he repeats, goes to a back to a bunch of places that he went to before, but then eventually decides he needs to go to Jerusalem. 
where he's arrested, and that's when things pick up on the, m- the climax where he's on his journey to Rome, which is a journey where he's imprisoned. Like, he's not just kind of going to Rome um, because he feels like it, although he does feel like it. He's going because he's, like, chained to a guard soldier or, th- or a few, right? He has a centurion that's and, a, and a, sol- a contingent of soldiers that are watching over him as he goes to have his trial in Rome. And so that's this. Um, I'm actually not sure about this little loop down here that goes below the title. Um, no one really knows, I guess, really, they t- because it's like they're just in a giant storm and they don't really know what's going on. But somehow they end up in Malta. So uh, who knows if it's more of a straight line or a big swoopy thing down near Carthage. Uh, but you can read all about it. And oh, that reminded me, I didn't make my uh, reading rainbow reference earlier on, right? <laughs> so it's like, you should read Acts, right? But don't take my word for it. Uh, yeah, okay. All right, Karen liked it. All right, good. Okay, all right. So there are these recurring patterns in the book of Acts. Thematic things, like things that happen over and over again. Um, certain people are praying and fasting together. So before Pentecost, before the Holy Spirit comes on them in power as a rushing wind and then tongues of fire over their heads and they're able to speak in tongues, the 140 disciples of Jesus, those who are left after his resurrection, 140 of them are gathered together and they are praying and they are fasting. And then the Holy Spirit moves. And this is a pattern that happens. It's not only in Pentecost. If you read the book of Acts, you'll see this happening again and again and again. Miracles occur. People are healed. People speak in tongues. Visions are given to people. And people are left going, what just happened? Right? Crazy stuff occurs. And then, because crazy stuff has occurred and people want to know what's happening, somebody needs to explain. And so the believers in Jesus are there and they say, well, since um, we know from Scripture this, and then they launch into these long, drawn-out explanations of, like, the whole history of of, uh, the Jewish people. Which, by the way, if we lost, like, all of the Old Testament somehow, we never had access to it again, you could get a really decent summary of, of the Old Testament just by reading the book of Acts. So you should read it. And believers go to where people discuss things like the Forum or the Acropolis or the synagogue of the given town. And Paul does this over and over and over again. Peter and John had a habit of going to the temple, this place called Solomon's Colonnade, and they would go there. And this is where people got together to discuss things. And they would explain some more. And this happens over and over and over again in the book of Acts. So, some highlights for me, since I can't do everything, but some things that stuck out to me. I gave you the story of Pentecost, which is cool. Fireballs, right? Rushing wind, speaking in tongues. So, all of the uh, Jewish people were supposed to go to Jerusalem for this festival called Pentecost or the Festival of Weeks, which was a harvest festival to harvest grain, to harvest wheat. Um, And it was an exciting time. And lots of people from all over different places speaking lots of different languages would come who were all different Jewish people of various kinds. So some people spoke Aramaic, some people spoke Latin, some people spoke Greek, and all different kinds of languages that I don't even know. And they all showed up in Jerusalem all at the same time. And while they were there to celebrate this Jewish festival that they were supposed to come there for, the Holy Spirit moves in power and the disciples, the apostles of Jesus, are able to speak to all these people in all these different languages that they wouldn't ordinarily know how to speak to. And so then they're able to testify about Jesus and who he is and what he's done. And Peter stands up and tells them all, and explains using the Old Testament scripture that the Jewish people that are gathered would have known and would have been familiar with to explain what's gone on. 
you should read it. It's great. Um, there's also a description of the earliest church right after that. So because of Pentecost, 3,000 people come to faith in Jesus and become the early church. So it goes from 140 to 3,000. There's a few other events, and then it eventually gets up to 5,000 before they're persecuted and sent out of Jerusalem, scattered everywhere. Um, and then we don't really get a number count um, about other things, uh, other places, especially where Paul is um, helping to convert and spread the news of people to people about Jesus. Um, but one story that stood out to me because I didn't remember it at all um, in previous times that I've ever read Acts was this thing that NIV titles the Believer's Prayer, which I don't think quite captures it. But I want to read it to you because I thought it was, it was cool. It just stood out to me as I was reading yesterday. So here it is. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, before that, I want to read the description of the earliest church because I, it's actually a huge inspiration for the way our church, the village, is. is because of the way this earliest church is described in the book of Acts. It says, they devoted themselves, speaking of the, the followers of Jesus immediately after Pentecost, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Okay, so now the believer's prayer. This is the part that surprised me. Upon their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And then this is in quotations, what they prayed to God. Sovereign God, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and to perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And then it, this is the part that struck me. It says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. It's like a second Pentecost is what it struck me as. And I just never caught that before. And I think what's really cool about that to me is that they asked God for this, and that's what God did for them as they gathered together in prayer. It's really cool. So that's the book of Acts. So how should we live in light of this? So some suggestions. We should pray and fast. So some of the most important moments in the book of Acts happen because the believers are gathered together, not just to pray, but also they're fasting. So they're restricting what food they're eating as they pray for greatest, greater seriousness in their prayer. And when that happens, when they're doing that, this is the pattern, as I said, the Holy Spirit moves with power. And crazy stuff happens. It's not always good things, by the way. So when the Holy Spirit moves in power, sometimes there's persecution that kicks you out of the city that you're in. Or at least that's what happened to the early church in Jerusalem. But sometimes really cool things like fireballs over people's heads. Yeah. Here's another suggestion for you. Be prepared to testify. So when the Holy Spirit moves and crazy things happen, people will be standing around going, what the heck just happened? And then your job as a believer is to explain the heck that has happened, okay? You should be prepared 
to testify because that's how people know. Remember we did that epistemology, right? We did that theory of knowledge. People know because people are told, and you know, and so you should testify to what you have seen and heard. Peter, in one of his letters, the Apostle Peter, who's a key figure of the book of Acts, says this to us. He says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So be prepared. And read Acts. Do it. It's great. So a suggestion. There are 28 chapters. If you read four chapters a day, you will finish in the next week. Just in time for Mark to speak to us about Romans. And you'll have all the backstory. You'll know who Priscilla and Aquila are and why they are, where they are, okay? And you'll, you'll get the backstory, all the important information about who Paul is and what his motivations are and what he cares about and who he's in relationship with, right? You'll get that good bromance stuff that I was talking about, right? Okay. So uh, if you'd like to talk to me during this week about how it's going, I plan to do this. I'm going to read four chapters a week. It's not going to be my marathon, like, nine-hour reading <laughs> in one day because I don't have time to do nine hours in one day usually. But on a Saturday, yesterday I did. But I'm going to do four chapters per day for the next week. So that's the book of Acts. How are we doing on time, Mark? We need to wrap up. Okay. I went long with my maps. All right. Hope you enjoyed.